Gavin Cleesby is the Director of Programs, Exhibitions, and Community Partnerships for the Massachusetts Historical Society, and I'm happy to welcome you to our program. Uh, while we have a small group, although actually a growing group, a good group for us uh, in person, uh, I know that we have over 300 people registered uh, for this program online, so we uh, have really seen a great interest in this program, so I hope uh, everyone is as excited as I am for it. Um, before we get started, I want to offer a special welcome to anyone who may be joining MHS for the first time. Uh, we have a lot of clocks. Uh, they're sometimes on time. That was pretty good. It was only a minute off. Uh, and sometimes they're wildly inaccurate, uh, but usually relatively close. Um, if you're not familiar with MHS, uh, we are the first historical society in America. We were founded in 1791. Uh, and for the past 230 years, we have been a resource for the public. We maintain a research library that provides access to a remarkable collection of manuscripts, including the papers of three of the first six US presidents. Um, we also uh, have the papers of uh, soldiers, mothers, poets, and protesters. Uh, we have galleries that are open to the public, uh, and we host a wide variety of programs uh, for both academic and, and general audiences. We're only able to produce these programs because of the support of our members. We hope you'll return for future events, and we hope you'll support our work be by becoming a member or making a contribution. This evening, uh, we have a great conversation. We are joined by Professors Laura Edwards of Princeton University and Christine Desson from the Harvard University Law School. Uh, they will be discussing Professor Edwards' new book, Only the Clothes on Her Back, Clothing in the Hidden History of Power in the 19th Century. Professor Laura Edwards is a legal historian whose research focuses on the 19th century United States. She holds a BA in American culture from Northwestern University and a PhD in history from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. She is the author of five books uh, and has received numerous awards uh, and citations. Uh, Professor Christine uh, Desson teaches uh, about international monetary system, the constitutional law of money, constitutional history, political economy, and legal theory. Her research explores money as a legal and political project, and her approach aims uh, to open economic orthodoxy to question, particularly insofar as it assumes money as a neutral instrument that, and markets as uh, autonomous phenomena. Uh, they will be discussing Professor Edward's new book, Only the Clothes on Her Back, which looks at uh, practices which made textiles a unique form of property that people without rights could own in exchange. Marginalized people use these textiles as currency, credit, and capital, but also as entree into the new republic's economy and governing institutions. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming our guests. Only the Clothes on Her Back is a big, beautiful book about a very unexpected subject, which is the legal and social, and I would even add political world, economic world that turned on clothes and on cloth more generally. Um, and, that, and that world sets apart women, including married women, subject to coverture, and enslaved people from others uh, particularly white males who have more formally recognized property rights. Um, so I will kick it, kick this discussion off by asking Laura to give us the gist, give us an, maybe not a nutshell about the book, but an overview, a map of the argument so that we can then dive in and take little pieces and explore them. So Laura, could you get us started? Yes. Um, so, and thank you, Chris, for doing this. And thanks to Massachusetts Historical Society for having this, uh, this presentation. I really appreciate it. And it's going to be fun to talk about this. Um, so this book kind of started accidentally in another book. And I had these court cases that kept troubling me. And one in particular kind of I don't know, it, it stuck with me. There's sometimes you read evidence and you find these things and it just kind of sticks with you because you can't figure out what's going on. And in this case, there was a man who um, went to the Justice of the Peace and claimed that his dress had been stolen. And then there was this court case about the theft of his dress. And this is in rural North Carolina, like in the 1820s. And I, I'm just like, 
Okay, so John Marshall here, I think his name was John Marshall, not the John Marshall, but a John Marshall. So John Marshall had his dress stolen. You're like, I'm thinking, what color is it? What was he doing with his dress? Is this a way more interesting, you know, part of North Carolina than I had anticipated in 1820? Does he wear it when he's plowing? I don't understand. But then when you actually, you go from kind of the formal document and then you go to how they're handling the case, it was very clear, it's not his dress, of course, it's his wife's dress. And the whole case is handled as his wife's dress, which struck me as really interesting. It's like, okay, we have to call it his dress, which is weird, but it's obviously her dress. And then, you know, we went back to her. And then I had another case with an enslaved woman who was accused of stealing cloth, but only after it had been determined that cloth of exactly that kind had been stolen, which meant that she had been walking around with this cloth, and there's all this there's all this testimony where she was walking around with this cloth, and, and nobody thought that was weird until they determined that cloth of exactly that kind had been stolen, which was days later. And I'm thinking, okay, these are really weird cases. And so I started sort of thinking through textiles and going through thinking about these cases. And then I started writing a chapter for this other book and it ended up being like 90 pages long, which is not a chapter, it's too much. So I put them all aside and I thought, well, this may be another book. So I went off and looked at other court cases and discovered that in fact, there was this presumption that clothing belongs to its wearer. And when you think about it, this makes sense. It's like, okay, that's your shirt please keep it on. We want you to have it, right? So, you know, it is also seen as something very personal as belonging literally to a person, expressing a person's identity. And this is then legally recognized. It's not recognized as a property right, but it is recognized as an attachment to the person in the area of public law where you are actually supposed to be affirming what is and what is, you know, customary in your community. And if it's customary for this white jacket to be mine, then law will uphold that fact that this white jacket is mine. And these kinds of legal principles are really embedded in the legal system and are, you know, practiced widely up and down the East Coast in the United States in the period between the Revolution and the Civil War. And actually what's happening here is they have all these legal principles that have, you know, actually been circulating for centuries. And those have really embedded themselves in the legal culture and in the legal system. So they're very deeply rooted and they predate the founding of the United States. And then people use this idea to basically claim everything that has anything to do with clothing that passes through their hands. So it's a shirt, it's a handkerchief, it's a hat, it's shoes, it's uncut cloth, it's bed linens. Oh, and there's the woman who made thousands of yards of cloth and oh, that's hers too. So people are very adept and creative at using these legal principles to then basically use this as to embed themselves in the economy. So because they can legally own this, these goods, they can then trade them. They use them as currency. They save them. It becomes capital. They use it as leverage for credit. So there's this whole economy that emerges because of these legal claims. And this economy involves all the people that we didn't think have property rights. So they can possess property and trade it and do all the things you can do if you have property rights because it is this particular kind of property textiles. And I was fascinated once I started looking for all of this because once you see it, it's everywhere. Um, and then the rest of the book traces how people are using this, what they do with this, and then ultimately why this declines over time. So by the time you get to the Civil War actually starts declining in 1830s, 40s, and 50s. But by the time you get to the Civil War and afterwards, a lot of the legal qualities, the value, the legal value of these goods is deteriorated, which then turns them into basically kind of just consumer goods. Whereas before they were this much more resonant form of property that you could do far more with. And all of that has to do with law. So this is, that was a great map. And I, now I want to zoom in and ask you to elaborate, right? Magnify certain parts of what you said. So one of the things you said is um, that people own this property, mm -hmm. but enslaved people can't, according to what we know, right. in the common law and under state statutory law, own property. Married women can't own property. So can you um, unpack that for us? Mm -hmm. That is, how are these categories of people who cannot own property legally entitled to their clothes and to the cloth they make. Right. 
you know, historians have really looked at those written laws, right? So statutes that are, you know, defining slavery and that prohibit slaves from owning property because they are property. And then also coverture, which is, you know, embedded in legal treatises, which is also embedded in the ways that appellate law works. Historians have looked at that written practice in the law. But in the period between you know, the revolution and the Civil War, the United States is actually also a tangle of jurisdictions beyond simply state law um, and written law, but also this tangle of jurisdictions with local practices. And all of these things with textiles really predate the establishment of states. They're also very much embedded in customary practice, but also the material goods themselves. And this is really hard to track down, actually. Um, I had a footnote crisis at one point because somebody said, well, this is all great, but we want the court case that defines, you know, when these people actually can have, you know, clothing in their own names. Isn't there a court case like that? It's like, no, there's not a court case like that because this is all basically in local records, the very lowest parts of the courts, local jurisdictions, municipal courts, county courts, justices of the peace. And in those courts, you don't get the written record describing how you're making a decision to the point of law. You just get the outcomes of the case. And so there you get practice. You get over and over and over again, somebody saying you claims by an enslaved person to thread, to cloth, to clothing, and then the court upholding that. And you kind of have to follow what is being done in practice to understand what principles are being followed. But as a result, you have to read like hundreds and hundreds of cases to figure out what's going on. And it's not just that one court case. You have to look at the practice and you have to kind of piece this together from what people are actually doing. But this is also opening up then a whole area of law that historians really haven't explored a lot, which deals with that customary practice with material relations um, and the ways that people also are making these claims by doing things like they bring in their clothes. I find this to be fascinating. For so, so here I want you to go on. I mean, I was going to ask you, how did you possibly find this? Right. How do you reconstruct practice? And you've given us a taste of that. When you reconstructed that practice, what did you find as a body of law? So one of the things you talk about is, you know, there's public law, there's private yeah. law, there's private law, there's criminal law. Can you locate the law of textiles within those categories? Yeah. And then can we unpack the categories a little Absolutely. bit? Absolutely. So we usually think when property ownership, you think of property law, civil, private law. So you have property rights, you have somebody who reneges on a debt, you go in, you have a debt case, um, but you need to be able to own property, you have the property rights, and then the law handles this with people who have property rights. Um, but these people don't have property rights. So for instance, this one case I use a lot, there's a woman, Sarah Allingham, she's a sheet. It was stolen. Actually, she loaned it to somebody, but she's a married woman. And she was expecting to get repaid on the loan of the sheet. Now, you know it's a loan because what happens with a loan is you loan the sheet, you don't want the sheet back a year later because the sheet will be used. It's like a used handkerchief, right? It's like if I loan you a handkerchief, generally I don't want it back. But in these instances here, it's a really, the handkerchief is really valuable. So if you loaned it, you would expect an amount of money or goods or services or something in return. And the same thing with her sheet. She had loaned it, she wanted the money back, but it was not paid. What does she do, right? She has no property rights, so she can't go in and say this was a debt gone wrong. This was a loan that wasn't repaid. She walks down to the magistrate, actually, it's a much more involved story. She finds the sheet. She tries to repossess the sheet. She brings the sheet down to the local court, municipal court in New York City. And she waves it around saying, this was stolen from me. Now, if she were a white man with property rights, this would be a civil matter, a property dispute over a debt. She's a married woman, so she can't do that. And this poor magistrate's like, oh my God, you know, I mean, all these magistrates are, they're, these people come in claiming that they want their clothing back, their textiles back, and what are they supposed to do? So they're like, okay, we're gonna move this over into the area of public law, which is about crimes, but it's also about the public order. So you can put things back where they belong in the area of public law um, without necessarily recognizing property rights. 
So Sarah Allingham Sheet can then be, you can adjudicate that as a theft case. It's actually a property dispute like any other property dispute, but the area of law makes it look different here. But it also allows this kind of case to go forward, right? Um, so a magistrate can say, okay, look, you know, your sheet was stolen, a sheet was stolen, all these married women are yelling at me. Um, so I'm going to figure out then whose sheet who the sheet belongs to, and I'm going to put the sheet back where it belongs, and then it'll all go away. And I've set the public order right, but I've not actually recognized anybody's property right, so it's all okay, right? So, so this is just seems to me like the thin edge of the wedge, right? Yes. That is to say, the fact that criminal law can operate, mm -hmm. can step in for civil property law, right, is one point. But you also imply that that's the tip of the iceberg, right? right? That there's a whole realm of customary law that is different and that's beneath or below or somehow obscured by what we are looking for right. normally. Right. So let me elaborate that a little bit. One of the things I found most fascinating about this part of the book was the implication that rights and the expansion of rights, which we think of as a net increase in legal entitlement mm -hmm. was actually um, not necessarily a net increase in legal entitlement. For some people it would be, but it was a shift in the kind of entitlements mm -hmm. that we are used to. And you can imagine where my mind went, which was you know, the rise of liberalism mm -hmm. and the rise of capitalism as a vocabulary that was atomizing and individuating the law mm -hmm. right into rights when there had been something else for better or worse something more customary something right. more relational something more right uh social right. um so is that part of what's going on or how should we read this other kind of law and and can we locate it in part of the trajectory of a changing kind of legal discourse yes so you know we usually think of the expansion of rights in the 19th century, right? So over the course of the 19th century, married women get property rights. Most dramatically, you have the abolition of slavery in which you know people of African descent then can no longer be enslaved. And then they acquire the whole range, at least men do, of rights. And we think of that as like a net gain, right? Because people didn't own property before. Oh, but now with rights, they can own property. And so, yes, I'm setting out a different world here where, in fact, it's possible in the early 19th century to own property without rights. And then what's happening is the legal system is moving toward a framework, a rights-based framework and elevating that. And then all these other people who own property without rights are really in trouble at that point, right? Because the ways that they made claims to property was not through rights. And a lot of the people in this period who are getting rights don't get them fully, right? So married women's property does not actually allow them, doesn't get rid of coverture, which limits their rights. It gives them a few property rights here to land that they inherited, um, to land that is given to them by other people. Oh, and then their wages, but only wages that they earn outside the household. So there's all of these sorts of limitations. Um, and then also with, um, you know, with uh, freed slaves, they also, as we all know, in the Reconstruction period, exercise of rights for formerly enslaved people is really difficult, right? So rights are extended, but they're limited. But then at the same time, we're getting rid of all of these other ways of owning property. Um, and those ways of owning property are really hard to see, and they're difficult, and I understand actually why rights are better, um, at least in the legal system and in, in the economy. The way that you make claims to your clothes is, as I suggested, you bring it in. So, for instance, in theft cases, which I found to be really weird, um, people would bring in, like, no, I didn't steal this bolt of cloth, see, I have it, or no, I didn't steal this dress, see, I'm wearing it. Um, and I'm going to bring in my you know, friends who say, no, I saw her wearing it. No, I saw her purchase that. Um, so you bring in all your friends and the material goods, because if you're wearing it and if you bought it in public, then you didn't steal it, right? You, you are, it is yours. You're displaying it publicly. Um, and so all of this requires the people who know you, if you don't have rights. So like, I would need to bring in you to show that you would justify them wearing my white jacket. I remember that jacket. Yes. And then, you know, you would also, I would bring in the white jacket too. And I'd bring in other friends who would say, no, 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 I saw you buy that. No, no, it was here. It was this date. So it's, 
And then you would establish it though in that place, right? So all of you would know I'm wearing the white jacket, but if I went someplace else and claimed my white jacket there, I would have to do this all over again, which might be very difficult because not all of you would be around to, to buttress this. So these, these ways of claiming are very localized, whereas rights are things that travel across state lines. They go throughout the entire you know, New Republic. So those are property, that's property in a way of claiming property that can move over space and time that doesn't, isn't so rooted in communities, um, which makes it really difficult, actually, if you want to have a nationally based economy, right? Um, it also makes it very difficult for these people to claim property outside of these communal spaces. Um, but as they move to rights, though, it still becomes really difficult for these people, married women in particular, but then women in general, and people of African descent, because they still don't have the full rights that allow them to move around and participate in this economy. So you see this new world emerging, and you see the old world going away, but you also see how very difficult this is going to be for people who have these marginal claims to rights to move and participate in this new world, too. So in some ways, it's about public order or public decency, yes. keeping the peace, not actually about no. relational concern for these people. Yeah, no, exactly. Okay, so another possibility that occurred to me yeah. that I'd love to hear that's a little more sanguine than that mm -hmm. um, is that the very pluralism of rights, of pluralism of claims, mm -hmm could create latitude for people and possibility for people. So when I was reading your book also reminded me of an old article. There's an old article by a law professor named Robert Cover that was called jurisdictional redundancy. And his argument was he wasn't even going to your level of local law. Mm -hmm. He was thinking about state federal. And the argument was that if there are two different places you can go for, for the enforcement of a right in his case, for the enforcement of a claim, let's say, um, it creates enough, the, the very possibility of forum shopping creates some latitude for the claimant mm -hmm. and to, you know, pits authorities against each other in a way that may actually allow people some more latitude, some more right. liberty. So do you think that's going on here or do we just have confusion and arbitrariness in the local nature of this? You know, I think I was really struck here. I mean, if, if you could see some of that of people kind of forum shopping, of trying to, you know, figure out who they can go to to recognize a particular claim. But I was struck at the respect given these claims. So I'll give you two examples here. There's one case in Charleston where this woman comes in, and again, I feel sorry for some of these magistrates sometimes. It's like, my bandana was stolen. And he's like, okay, okay, we're gonna write this down. You know, he start, gets out his little forms and he's, he's writing this down. It's like a bandana, how much is it worth? A penny. So he continues on with this case, right? And I'm like, why didn't you throw her out of your office? You're gonna spend your afternoon tracking down a case in a penny bandana. And then it actually turns out it's a counterfeit bandana because real bandanas are made in India. And this one's a counterfeit, which meant that it was you know, locally made and not as good. And it was really only a half a cent. Um, and so he's very serious, though. It's like, we're going to make sure that, you know, we figure out the case of the missing bandana here. Um, and, you know, mattress just do this all the time. And the thing that is also really surprising is that they do it even with poor people, married women, enslaved people too. So magistrates, you know, take very seriously claims made by enslaved people. And it's us, it's a little hard to figure out how actually some of these claims get into the court because the documentation will say, oh, you know, it's, for instance, there's a woman, Polly, who has thread that she's made. And the documentation will say the thread belongs to, was stolen from the house of her master. But then again, you open up the case and they treat it as Polly's thread. And in fact, Polly walks into the court saying to the magistrate, this actually isn't a court, it's more like somebody's yard, says, the thread belongs to me. And the wording's really interesting there and I think telling because she's not saying, I own the thread. She said, the thread belongs to me in the way that clothes belong to you, right? It's the legal qualities, the materials themselves that attach it to the person. But the magistrate takes this very seriously. I mean, he's gonna to get to the bottom of the missing thread again and figure out who took it. And it's also fascinating to me that masters and mistresses go along with all of this too, that it is such a sense that this is part of the public order, that this has such currency within 
the way that they're thinking about law, but they're also thinking about property, that even people who you think wouldn't necessarily go along with it, go along with it. Um, and that kind of strikes me. And it, it, it suggests to me that there is also, and I feel like you were saying this tip of this iceberg, that there is this world out there of customary practice um, that has a lot of legitimacy that mm -hmm. also flows through various kinds of jurisdictions. Um, and that we haven't really fathomed it because we're so accustomed to thinking of laws written in those books that have the gold lettering and the leather backings. And um, we're not uh, used to thinking about this, it's the oral nature of this, the material elements of this, the way that law was instantiated in people's lives. And I find that part really fascinating. We often think of laws over there. And the way I'm seeing law is actually, it's on people's bodies, right? It's the way they move through space. It's also then how they can use those material goods, not just as things that they own and consume, but as things that connect them to the world and the legal world in a really profound way. So I would love to follow that a little bit further and then maybe go to customer law, more, customary sure. law more generally, but to, to think about the way textiles functioned. Mm -hmm. You said at the outset they functioned as currency and as capital mm -hmm. and in the book as credit. Can you spell that out for us? Can you give us some examples of how currency operated as how yeah. textiles operated as currency, one of my favorite topics, <laughs> and how textiles operated as capital right. and as credit. So I will give you, I'm moving to a, an image, if I can do this. Oh, here we go. I'm the wrong thing. There we go. Okay, so this is a caricature of a banknote. And banknotes in the United States it were really difficult to use. You, know, it's, it's a, you have a face value on the banknote, but who knows if it's actually worth that? And they're like banknotes from all sorts of banks. They're from states. They're like, they're all over the place. And if you are also a person without property rights, if you run around with a banknote, it's suspicious. So if you're an enslaved person with a banknote, people are going to presume that you stole it or that you shouldn't have it. By definition, you're having it makes it stolen property. At least you shouldn't be having it. And there's all these stories, too, of married women and counterfeit banknotes. They're always, if you read the popular liter literature of the time, you think married women spent all their time harassing poor merchants passing counterfeit notes. But all of that is really about the questions of, you know, certain people without property rights, the legitimacy of their owning this kind of thing and, and using it. And textiles are better because it's presumed that you do own it. So it's not really that like unusual to see people walking down the street with bolts of cloth or handkerchiefs or shirts or pants or dresses or whatever, right? So the presumption is you own it so you can trade it. And then, my goodness, textiles come in all this array of different denominations. So you have small handkerchiefs and even with handkerchiefs, it's like, you know, you can see it. Whereas a banknote, you can't tell what it's worth, but a handkerchief, it's like, if it's a good handkerchief, it's usually worth about a dollar. If it's like been used, you discount it, but you can see it so you know how much to discount it. If it's a better handkerchief, like it's silk handkerchief with red and designs and whatnot, one of those bandanas, um, although those are cotton, not silk, but those would be worth more, right? And then you have shirts, and you that's medium weight. If you have like long cuts of cloth and you could cut them up into smaller bits. So it works really well. And you see taverns, actually your taverns and used clothing stores because so many people pay for their liquor with cloth that taverns sell used clothes as well because that's what the currency that they're getting. Um, and so people are just routinely using textiles as currency and you don't often notice it because what they're doing is they're valuing it in the standard unit of account which would be pounds and shillings and then dollars and cents so you know i'm looking at somebody's shirt and i'm thinking john i'm looking at john's shirt over there it's blue i would be thinking dollars and cents looking at that shirt i wouldn't think oh it's a blue shirt you would know these things so well that that's what you would see is the value of those things and you you it's this interesting world where the thing that is so personal is also pers because it is so personal you can then alienate it really easily and you can get rid of it really easily because everybody knows how the value of the stuff and it's wanted and it holds its value better than some of these banknotes in fact so people are using this as currency and the other example I'm so going on but capital and yeah give, yeah can you give us some stories I actually teach a chapter that Laura wrote 
in my constitutional law class that's about money. So we're totally immersed in money. And suddenly in the 19th century, we have this article about textiles that reframes things and makes you realize not so easy. Yeah. So great, some great examples of the use of textiles as currency. Could you make it concrete for us? Yeah, yeah. So, well, my favorite currency one story is the prison society in Philadelphia. And they're very intent, it, since clothing does represent who you are, um, if you're going to reform prisoners, they need to be well dressed. So these nice Quakers are trying to figure out how to get clothing to people so that they will be reformed. But as soon as they hand out the clothes when they come into the prison, um, they take them off and they trade them for liquor. And they, it's like, oh, th that's not what we wanted, right? And so they have this real dilemma. It's because like, how can you be a good person badly dressed? But, but, but as soon as we dress you well, then you trade it for liquor. But then it's also, I think, really fascinating because trunks, I realized, were crucial here. So I had these hundreds of cases. I had listed out trunks in a lot of them, and, and there was always like clothing or cloth in trunks, and they always mentioned the trunk. So after a while, it's again, it's that repetition over time. It's like, why trunks? Why do we keep talking about trunks in court cases? I have no idea. But a trunk is a legal container for the usually the textiles that you put inside so if you put them inside the trunk then they're yours and then i thought oh my gosh this is like my grandmother and my mother my grandmother had a trunk and she had you know linens beautiful you know actually white embroidered linens that her mother had given her when she got married and my mother actually had a trunk too with similar things she also put her wedding dress in there i'm like oh my gosh and i started then reading some of the diaries and letters of of women in the 19th century differently, because we thought of their trousseaus, their trunks, the things that they bring into their marriage. It's like, well, that's the things they're going to use. But actually, it's more than that. It's actually the capital that they're bringing into the marriage. So there's this group of women in West Virginia, Western Virginia, not actually West Virginia. It's like at the corner of North Carolina and Virginia where it meets there. Um, the Cooley women, they have a manufacturing business where they produce all kinds of cloth. Um, they also um, do tailoring. One of the big things they do is do the, the coats for militia musters. So all the men need to come to the militia muster and look sharp. And they have the braids and the epaulettes and the colors and everything. So they do all of that tailoring for the guys. And then they show up and they look you know, cool at their militia muster. Um, so they do the tailoring. They also help with dressmaking in the area. Um, they have this big business. And you know, if you look, most people have sort of, well, it's, it's just domestic production. It's actually, no, 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 no. What's happening is they are producing goods, the value of which they can keep. And they do, because they trade on their own names in the local store. But then the mother who is in charge of this business, basically what she's doing is allotting then those goods to her daughters, essentially paying her daughters. Her daughters have these trunks full of, when they trade their, their other you know, things they make, they trade it for expensive fabrics, you know, fancy cottons, printed cottons, silks, fine wools. They put all of that in their trunks, but that's what they can keep. That's what wives can keep. So some of these daughters did not marry men who were particularly adept financially. Um, one of them moved to Missouri and lost his farm. But creditors can come after his property, but not what's in the trunk. What's in the trunk belongs to the wife. I'm like, oh my gosh. So when you know there's complaints in the early 19th century, late 18th century, all these women who are just into these luxuries and all of this, you know, these these consumer goods, buying all of these fancy, you know, dress goods and stuff. What they're doing is they're not consuming this. It's it's investment. They put it in their trunks. It's the sort of thing that they can keep and claim. It's their capital. And a lot of them also then draw down that capital to support their families in key moments and key times because creditors can't get to that. Their husband's creditors cannot get to that part. So Laura, can we take that all the way to production? That is to say, can we go beyond investment, beyond you know a nest egg for one's mm -hmm. family? Can we get, there's the potential of a parallel economy there, right? right? Of women, actually running affairs and and producing and earning 
and and then investing. Right. How far does it go? I was a little shocked by how far it went, actually. Um, and the problem is you can't really quantify this because part of it is keeping it quiet. So when women make accounts, if they put it in the form of accounts, which the, the form of accounting, you know, the account books that people keep, it's a legal form. If you put it in that legal form, then it is the kind of account that is legally actionable in private law in civil suits. So if women or enslaved people put their claims in that legal form, it would automatically sort of move to the masters, the husband side of the ledger. So people try very hard who don't have property rights to keep track of all of this in different ways. And they do this in their diaries. One woman actually says very clearly, for the things that are in the family account, you must keep written form accounts. For the things that you make in yourself, it's best to keep memoranda. And by memoranda, it's a different form. And she's keeping track that way, but in a form that still allows her, if she's questioned, to make legal claims to this kind of property. But there's a lot going on here with, well, back up a second. Most, much of the historiography, historians have noticed that women are often in textile trades. It's like, they're in textile trades, not just because somehow it's been gendered that way, um, but it's also because it is the kind of property that married women and actually all women can make and then make the most credible legal claims to. So it's like, of course, they're in the textile trades. Um, and then they keep and can keep more of the value than of what they produce. And then they can trade it and they often trade it for more textiles, which they can keep, right? And then trade. Um, but then tracking this is, the logic makes sense, but tracking it is hard because then they're hiding what they're doing essentially, because you know you, you can keep it and you don't want it to take sort of the accounting, the form that will move over to the husband's side of the ledger or the master's side of the ledger, which means that you're always kind of like covering your tracks. Um, and a lot of this is also oral. So for instance, a sewing bee, all the women get together. They know who made what. They can testify to who made what. It becomes a way of accounting, you know, through social relationships as to what's going on. But that's also the kind of thing that disappears in the historical record as well. But I think that part of what we've missed here is the value of women's labor. Um, we've sort of assumed, I think, too soon that women's labor is, the, the value had been drained out of that by the 19th century, and that it is purely domestic, when in fact, a lot of this domestic labor is commercial. And that the line also, interestingly, between what is commercial and domestic is much blurrier here as well. Because if you look in somebody's trunk, it's like, okay, there are things you can wear, but you could also trade them. It's both at the same time, and it's very contextual. It depends on the moment, whether it is commercial or not. And I think this also says something about the economy more generally. I think that it's the same actually for men too. So that is a great segue to the next thing I was gonna ask you. In just a moment, actually we're gonna open it up and I'm, before we get there, I wanna ask you what changes. But one last question about this whole customary realm, which is now that you've pulled back the curtain, mm -hmm. Where else would we find it? So is it just textiles? Are there other whole customary, customary realms that we have neglected that you should write another book on or that the rest of us should write on? <laughs> and where else do we look for this? You know, I don't know. I mean, I'm hoping other people will discover these things. I mean, in some ways I feel like I've overstated textiles, but it's because like, it was the thing that was so, it became kind of my obsession, I guess. Um, but it was also what I was studying and it was everywhere, right? So textiles seemed to stand out. And there are points where I said unique in the book. And, you know, I would be happy to be proven wrong on that, that it's not unique, that there are other realms of customary law. Um, but one of the things that gave me pause was when I realized the power of legal forms to shape what we're seeing. So, and when I mentioned that, you know, well, I think some of this blurry line between commercial and not commercial also applies to men. I think that's the case partly because I became very aware of how the documentation in civil cases turns 
relationships among commercial or property relationships among men into something that looks different from what's happening with women because of the documentation itself. So for instance, I go back to my first example with John Marshall and his dress, his stolen dress, right? It's the documentation makes it look like his dress and turns something that is not his dress into his dress. But that same kind of documentation turns these more blurry kinds of exchanges between men and they're still relying on the kinds of documentation and ways of owning things that women are it's like oh no that's my bale of goods over there and it's my bale of goods and we know this because i brought in harry and dick and you know and they're, they're all going to testify to this and um it isn't quite as formalized but there are written forms and the legal forms make it look that way. So to me, one of the takeaways of this is, oh, I think we need to be more critical of the way that we treat those legal forms and how that is shaping what we're seeing. And I think it's the case for women and enslaved people, all people without property rights, but I think you can do the same thing for men. And then we may see more customary forms there that we've not seen because it gets sort of moved away in the legal forms themselves. So what changed? I mean, can, do you understand? I understand that these kinds, this customary realm diminishes and rights expand, mm -hmm. but why and how? What, can you tell us that story? You know, this was the part that I found the most difficult. And the first time somebody asked me that question, I went to a panic because it's like, oh, I think I've forgotten how that works. Oh my gosh. It was so hard to figure mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, over time you see that Sort of the legal value of textiles begins to deteriorate. And I was convinced that, I mean, it's harder and harder for people to make these cases. You also see um, the kinds of uses of, of textiles as currency and capital also deteriorates. And I was convinced at first this was about the economic value, because this starts happening in the 1830s and 40s. And while you know we have this big boom of cottons early on, actually, you know silk wool linen continues to be done by hand um but you really have sort of the explosion of cottons in the 1830s and 40s and it tends to depress the prices of all textiles which start to go down really fast and i'm like well maybe it's because they're so cheap and there's certainly all these cases from 1840s and 50s where people are stealing like huge masses of textiles now so instead of like stealing one handkerchief you steal like a bundle of handkerchiefs and like a bundle of shirts too and that's part of, you know, the fact that they're cheaper and there's like more of them around. It's like, that doesn't explain it all. Um, and so ultimately too, it has to do with, I think, changes in the legal profession. So in this period, you start having lawyers being trained in particular ways. You have treatise literature becomes really important. You have movement away from this idea that you learn law through practice first, but you start learning law through written records first. Um, and the way it's people are reading the same sort of group of treatises and written records. And none of those written records have anything about any of the practices related in textiles. So for instance, you know, they go through great detail about, you know, procedure and how you understand this and that if you have a, you know, a debt case, but nobody says anything about trunks and there's all these elaborate rules with trunks. So like, if you leave the lid of your trunk open, you have not reduced the property in it to your possession. So if you're a servant in somebody's house and you, they find like a napkin in your trunk and the lid is open, you can credibly argue that you did not steal it because you didn't close the lid. So if you close the lid, but don't lock it, it's a gray area because you can always open it and take it back out, right? <laughs> but if you close the lid and you lock it, it's like, okay, you've now, you've now like crossed the Rubicon, you've actually reduced these things to your possession. And the locks are really, really crucial. And then it's not only just about locking, it is symbolic. There are trunks with like one trunk is stolen, it has 20 locks on it. Because that's like really showing you that the things in there are really, really, really mine. If you don't get it from the one lock, you're gonna get it from the 20 locks. There's nothing about any of this in any of the treatise literature, right? So all of the customary ways of showing that you own things, all the customary ways of understanding what distinguishes a loan where you expect money back from something different where you don't, where it's the kind of, oh, I just loaned you the dress. None of that is there. So lawyers who are up and coming are not learning about this. 
And then slowly over time too, this kind of more procedural way of understanding where it's more important that the person who is bringing the case, even in a criminal matter, that they have rights and we follow the proper procedure, not the substance necessarily of like how we determine whether you own the property or not, it flips over to that process. And as that starts happening, and as courts start using that more and more, then these customary practices kind of go by the wayside. They seem less legal and they seem more cultural, right? So it sort of moves out of the ambit of law into the ambit of culture so that we start seeing them as something else, that we started seeing them as cultural, not legal. But that is a transition that starts really happening in the 1850s. And then by the time you hit like, the late 19th century, people don't really remember this anymore, although we still have the echoes of it, like with my grandmother's trunk. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and once you start thinking about it, it's like, oh, actually, we have a lot of echoes of it, but we kind of lost the sense of what that means because of this more embedded world where, you know, our relationship to actual physical things around us was different, but also our relationship to law was different too. Maybe we should open it up. Um, maybe while people are thinking of their questions, I'll ask you one more, which yeah. was just did Mary Lincoln, you end the book, right. right, by talking about Mary Todd Lincoln and her traumatic attempt to sell her own clothes. Did that also put the nail in the coffin, if you will, <laughs> right. of using textiles as tradable instruments? Right. Can you tell that story and, and right. extrapolate so from it for I us? Just I was trying to figure out how to end this book. And then I discovered that Mary Todd Lincoln tried to sell her wardrobe after her husband was assassinated. I'm like, oh, wow. And now you can go online and like, you know, newspapers and you can like type in Mary Todd Lincoln ward. It's all over the place. They have articles about this in Utah. Who knew, right? Um, so, and it's because it becomes this huge deal. It's like, I cannot believe that Mary Todd Lincoln would be selling her old clothes. This is terrible. This is so embarrassing. This is awful. And they start going through, you know, that the, the clothes are, ugh, they look terrible. They have sweat stains in unmentionable places. And it, she starts looking like a prostitute, actually. They sort of, sort of they, they compare her to a prostitute, somebody this desperate, a woman of this low character, only that woman would sell her clothes. Um, which of course is silly because there are whole streets in most cities dedicated to sale of used clothing and women have been doing this for like centuries and it's actually established practice for um, aristocrats in England and to, to sell their clothes from time to time, especially when they go in hard times and clothes are worth a lot of money. It's like women's capital, of course you sell it. Um, everybody knows this, but it's part of this like moving away from clothes as this property that people without rights can control to something that is simply a consumer good. It's an outer skin. And as an outer skin, it becomes kind of like weird that you would even wear somebody else's clothing. And it's like, it's only that, it's not anything else. And what's really sad here, so I think it's more, it's not the nail in the coffin, but it is representative of where things are going even though at that time people are still, they still know better, they should know better. Um, and what's really sad here is Elizabeth Keckley, who is the African-American woman who designed Mary Todd Lincoln's clothes. And she's often misidentified as a seamstress. She's anything but, she owns her own business. She's a designer. Um, she doesn't actually probably sew the, her, those clothes. She hires people to do that. And she's well known for you know designing, but designing is not just drawing a picture. It's actually the ability to fashion clothes that fit particular bodies, cut those pieces out of a flat piece of fabric, turn them into a three-dimensional item, make them fit on particular people. It's a real skill. And she's able to do this phenomenally well and has been outfitting you know, the wives of the Washington elite for quite a while. But basically it's her skills that are ridiculed here too. And so this is the other part of the metaphor too, is that, you know, her skills are being devalued and ridiculed, which is also sort of where we're going to be going with the value of this kind of labor to the ability of people to turn basically their labor into value. This is also going to go away for people like Elizabeth Keckley, who had actually used her skills to buy her way out of slavery. Um, so, yes, I mean, that's the other piece of this that I think is a really sad tale and sad in a more profound way, too, that 
we have turned these things that used to have such resonance in people's lives into simply stuff that you use and throw away. And it has no more meaning than that. And I find it really fascinating to think about the relationship, in fact, to the material world and these kinds of goods in particular that people used to have. And it's a little sad, that part. Okay, well, we have questions both uh, from people online and people in the room. Um, so just to start us off with a question from a person online, uh, Chloe wrote, uh, I love your reading of wardrobes, trunks uh, of textiles as women's banks, which function as a kind of extra state system of capital that both subvert and work with uh, patriarchal systems. Question, did you find anything in your research that might suggest why this fascinating and clearly so important topic of textiles and dress has been overlooked in traditional histories, aside from them just being uh, conventionally associated with women? Oh, gosh, I don't know. I mean, once I started putting this together, it's like this stuff is so obvious that I felt like I was kind of like people would be bored. It's like, don't we know this? Shouldn't we know this? Isn't this obvious? Um, but I think it is that it got hidden actually later on. I mean, part of this really is about the law. It's it's those it's the law that makes it possible that makes this whole thing possible, right? And because we've simply assumed that the only way that you can own property is through rights, then everybody assumes that if you didn't have rights in the early 19th century, you could not own property. And once you go there, then it's like, oh well, if women can't own property, then none of what they made they could claim right and if enslaved people couldn't own property then they were not participating in the economy in any way and so you don't even bother to look right and so i feel like this this, this the hegemony of this rights-based world that starts emerging and taking over really does kind of hide what is happening in the earlier period. So we didn't even bother to look. And you know, when I first would tell people, I had trouble actually kind of thinking this through. It's like, well, this is not really legal. This is like a shadow economy. This is underground. This is outside of law somehow. And it's like, no, this is entirely negotiated through law and enforced through law. But I don't think you look for it at all if you assume that rights is the only and the primary way of making your way in the world. So uh, if anyone in the room has a question, you can raise your hand. I can bring you the microphone so that people online can hear you. Or we can go to another online question. OK, uh, so Kristen says, uh, does the fashion of wearable textiles affects their value? Or is that not apparent in the records? Or in another way of looking at it, do household linens slash textiles hold value longer than wearable textiles? Yeah, that's a good question. All of it depends on use, right? So if you use your household linens, they, they decline in value, right? Um, dress, people though try to hold on to the value, which I thought was really interesting. And this is where, I, I don't think legal historians usually go into um, the material culture archives and I look at dresses and things and but it was really actually very informative because when you talk to you know people who um, are involved in the museum world and I do the history of costumes um, and dress uh, and you have them walk you through you realize that actually what women did and actually men too was try to preserve the value of their clothes so the, what makes the whole Mary Todd Lincoln story so stupid for lack of a better word here um, is that women like we made their clothes last for decades so fashion moves fairly slowly so it's about 10 years for a dress to go out of style and what tends to go out of style is a shape but also you would alter a dress according to its like accessories so the ribbons the trimmings and whatnot so you get your basic dress and then you could change it by the trimmings you could turn it inside out too to preserve it um people would put you know for long skirts i don't know like if you had a long coat and you walk and you kick it and the lining you know gets destroyed well you could put in you know another lining around the base of the dress or put a ruffle on to and then put matching ruffles on 
Um, but then also the shapes are, there's so much fabric that you can change the shape. So if you go from a big kind of hoop skirty kind of thing to something with a bustle in the back, all you do is you reconfigure the gathers and you put the bustle in the back. So there's all sorts of ways that you can actually alter according to fashion. And people tried to keep things going for the longest amount of time, but then you look for where. And this is also where, like, if you're like a washerwoman, you create value by cleaning the fabrics. So you are, you can actually rehabilitate some of the stuff and kind of keep it going for quite a while. Um, and then household linen, some of them you don't use. I still have napkins from my grandmother's trunk that nobody's ever used, right? But you were keeping those because you were storing the value of those. And that would be different from like a dish towel, for instance. Okay. Uh, so if anyone in the room wants to raise their hand, feel free. Uh, but we can also say, um, Hildegard said, uh, presume some of this textile property was the product of women's labor in the home. In addition to the development of property rights, didn't the emergence of the Industrial Revolution further erode these personal property slash common laws? Yeah, you know, the usual story here is Lowell Mill girls, right? So in cotton. So we have cotton factories, you have women going into the cotton factories, and then you have sort of the deterioration of the value of their labor too. Um, but what I didn't get, and I like ended up again reading in a whole body of literature I never expected to be expected to have facility in like the production of silk and wool and linen um, and you know practicing like learning how to spin linen and, and figuring out how to anyway um, what you what I discovered is that alongside um, the mechanization of cotton it, you increase the demand for other kinds of fibers like wool and linen um, but those are still done by hand mostly and so when you have a wool mill it's it's usually a collection of people who are still doing a lot of the work by hand and that's done mechanization of wool is very slow mechanization of silk is fairly slow and linen isn't actually mechanized until late 19th early 20th century but interestingly the more cloth you make the more demand you have for more cloth so actually when you have textiles cottons being produced mass produced through factories what you see is moving up alongside them are all sorts of hand labor industries too, with wool, with linen, which are also increasing with the increase in cotton production. So hand labor actually increases with mechanization of cotton. And then the more cottons you have, the more fabrics you have, the more you have to sew. And so there's also an increase in that kind of production as well. So hand labor doesn't go away, which I thought was interesting. In fact, it persists. And you even find people who are spinning for the market in the 1850s and it's a little jaw drop and it's like you're spinning and making money spin I mean, you're not supposed to be doing that right but people are still doing that in the 1850s well i think we just have time for one last question which was um uh, a person who i have now lost their question but they ask if the question about uh mary todd lincoln selling her wardrobe in utah was written by a man or written by a woman <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, well, she wasn't selling her wardrobe in Utah. It was the newspaper yeah, covered. Yes, but most of this is written by men who would sometimes purport to be quoting their wives, who are usually ridiculing Mary Todd Lincoln. Um, who knows if they actually were? So, yes, it was mostly male reporters. I was stunned, though, at the reach of the story. I mean, it's it would move very quickly all over the United States. So. Well, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation, and I hope everyone uh, watching and here will consider buying a copy of the book. Thank you for coming. <laughs>